welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm your host, Derek Champagne. I'm excited about our guest today. We have Suzanne Polinski. She is a CEO at The Rockstar Advocate. Suzanne, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks so much for having me. So I want to hear a little bit about your background. My background is in music as well before starting this agency, and, and for many years that was, was my heart and soul of what I did and, and still do as a hobby, and it uh, would have been great to have your service back in my day, <laughs> uh, even though social media was not as prominent, it was just becoming prominent when I was playing. So tell me about your background and about how you got to where you are today. Sure. So, um, well, I went to school at Drexel University for music business. It was a brand new uh, major at the time. We were the first graduating class. And I studied music law. I studied um, acoustics and many other things that were tied to the music industry. I really got a, a full spectrum education there. And while I was there, I interned at Atlantic Records here in New York. And um, after doing that and really working hard at the internship and making some great connections, I graduated early from Drexel and went on to become the um, Midwest sales coordinator at Astroworks. It was a uh, subsidiary of uh, EMI, hmm. and back when Tower Records and Sam Goodies and all of that stuff still existed, right. I ran those accounts for the Midwest uh, hmm. region for Astroworks. So um, that felt really good, uh, you know, being right out of college and being given that responsibility. And I also ran their national street team back when there were also street teams at uh, right. labels where there would be people that would run out and put up posters and, and make sure the CDs were displayed prominently in the retail stores in their section. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I actually enjoyed that more than dealing with the accounts um, on the sales side of things. And um, I decided about a year in that it really wasn't my thing that I didn't like sales and um, I wanted to be more on the creative end and at that time my uh, college roommate and I were kind of creating our own record label our own independent label and we wanted to see where that went so I left Astroworks which was kind of a scary move I mean I kind of you know I knew friends of mine and so many others were just dying to get into a label and dying to, uh, you know, have their own office and work in that type of environment. But it was just a lot different than I thought it would be. And so I wanted to take my own crack at it and see if I could create a different type of business um, that my roommate and I had had wanted to create. So we did that for a little while and realized we took on a lot more than than we realized in terms of <laughs> running a label at 22 years old. Um <laughs> It was interesting. We did sign an act in Philly, and we definitely learned a lot, but we realized we didn't want to be managers. We didn't want to be um, people running running careers so minutely. Uh, we wanted more of putting the power in the artist. We didn't want to feel like Svengali's or that we were puppeteers or controlling or any of that stuff. Um, it made us very uncomfortable. Yeah. So we thought, why not start teaching artists how to run businesses themselves? So we began writing their bios and doing their uh, press kits for them and, and coming up with social media plans for them and stuff like that. And that went on for a few years. And then we decided we both had different views of where we wanted to take things and we amicably split. And then I felt like I needed to regroup. So I went back and I got my master's in psychology. It was something I'd always wanted to do. And after really getting immersed in that and learning about the importance of mindset and learning about the importance of a clear uh, vision, 
um, I realized, wow, that is really lacking in the industry. And that part, you know, as, as much as I love writing bios and doing stuff, that's really not, there are plenty of people that can write bios. There's, there's not enough teaching artists how to handle it all. Um, and that's really what, once I finished my master's, I really was like, okay, this is what I love to do. And this is how I'm going to combine everything that I've learned in these last 10 or 12 years. And, um, that was a few years ago. And now this is what I do. And I, I love it. I, I still write bios once in a while and, and press kits, but the crux of it is here's all the information you can gather on the internet. And I'm going to teach you how to in, digest it and how right. to apply it to your own situation. Well, that's really exciting. So for me, my early days of running this agency now, but my early days, and I write about it in my book, talk about my days of being a, a street team promoter and, and playing in bands on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood back in the early 2000s. And I learned a lot from them with boots on the ground and some of that grassroots type marketing that I still take with me today and even apply into client campaigns that are outside of the industry. What are some of the kinds of things you took away from your background that, that you feel you draw from still even to this day that, that stand out to you? Yeah, great question. Um, when What I love so much about working with the street team at Astroworks was you know, when I came on, they were very disheartened. I guess whoever was there before me kind of didn't appreciate them or had so much on their plate that they didn't make them a priority. And I really, what I learned there and why it was one of my favorite parts of being there, it was really just showing them how much the label appreciated their work because they were going out there on the ground level and really contacting fans and and speaking on our behalf and representing us on on a one-to-one level. And, you know, the funny thing about that is even though we don't have accounts anymore like Tower Records and Sam Goodies, we have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And so I still use that same mentality when I teach artists how to talk to their fans, you know, appreciate them. I mean, your street team is your core fan base. Um, Those are those fans that are going to go out and say, hey, listen, they're playing tonight. You have to come, you know, check out this band. That's your street team. And sending them a free T-shirt in the mail and surprising them or calling them out on social media and letting them know how amazing they are. I mean, that that stuff really goes such a long way. And the morale was so different um, by the end of my year with that street team, just with simple things of like spotlighting one of them each week in the email that went out to the whole team. Huh. You know, that made them feel so great. So spotlighting a fan in your newsletter or, um, you know, sharing their latest status uh, to your followers and then, you know, thanking them for their time, you know, something as small as that really goes a long way. And I think that's really what I've taken is that human connection. It's it's so important and it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. It just takes a little bit of of thinking and prioritizing. Yeah, and and, show, and seeing that appreciation. We were just presenting a marketing plan a couple hours ago to a client and talking about what we call brand ambassadors, and it's not in the music industry, but I think it applies to so many different niches as well beyond music where when you have those that sing the praises and they're, that are volunteers for you and they're, they, they're, I mean, they're a brand ambassador, they're your street team, it's important to recognize them and not take them for granted and, rec- and, and look at what's important to them and highlight it. So I think that's a great lesson to learn. Yes, absolutely. It looks like for you, your time. I mean, you were in the music industry in the early 2000s at some point as well. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yes. Correct. So, and, and I was as well. And I stepped out of it in, in mid two, in 2006, I believe. And, and so when the, when the big emergence of social media happened, what, what changes have you seen within the industry? For me, we were in, I was in California in 2000, I believe. And, and Capitol Records was a, was the Capitol Records was a big tower there and a landmark in Hollywood. And we, we had those labels you're talking about, or the, the music stores of Sam Goody's and all of those, which are not there now right with with the with the emergence of technology and and social media and platforms and and crowdsourcing just tell me about how some of social media and and, and advances of technology have changed and you've you've continued to stay with it so i'm really curious about your take on it for the music industry yeah it's um it's been really interesting i i left astroworks in 2006 and as i was running my business with my roommate i actually was working as a paralegal trying to learn you know we wrote our own contracts and trying to learn all of that stuff. Um, and so it was interesting kind of being on the outside and I felt like I had one foot still in it and one foot out of it. She actually also at that same time went to work for a social media startup and was doing all of their 
um, social media managing and she was learning all about, you know, like Twitter was just coming out and, and the importance of hashtags. And, you know, I learned so much from her, what she learned at her day job. Like our rule was don't take a job unless it's going to benefit our company. And um, so that, you know, she handled that aspect and I handled the legal aspect. And, and what I learned about the changeover was that, you know, you you could no longer just spend you know work spend your year or so working on your album and then and then taking the time to get the marketing all together and then putting it out and people just see the finished product um the the real goal was you know sharing your journey because huh. the goal should no longer at least i hope artists are realizing no longer uh just to get signed the goal is right. to sell music and the way you do that is building your fan base um don't forget that the fans are are the reason and you don't need a label anymore to do that. You don't need a label to get your CDs into a Sam Goody. You just need to get yourself up on the internet and and sell it. And the way to do that is to make make everybody a part of your journey. So I always tell artists the way that it's changed, it's kind of like the way TV has changed, you know, with the emergence of reality TV. These celebrities have come out of sharing their story online for all to see and that's the same thing that artists need to be doing is is there's no reason you can't uh take a photo with your phone or take a quick video of what you're doing with your day and sharing that with people so that they see what this journey is like because that that's going to set yourself apart from the other singer and the other songwriter and the other rapper and and that's you know with the emergence of social media you're you, so many more musicians have come out of the woodworks, right. you know, because they see that they have a chance to do what they've always wanted to do. And instead of letting that frighten you, let that empower you and let yourself stand out by just just be you, just showcase you, be a little bit more vulnerable and it will pay off. That's good advice. Yeah, I remember when the labels had all the power, and, and that was, again, during my journey. And, and for us, I remember with management, our agents were sitting down and making an intentional decision. Do we hit the road and grassroots this, or do we mm-hmm. push for the label? To, and so it was all label showcases. And, I mean, it was just I, I've lived that world, and, and it's changed so much. And I'm the old guy. I feel like the old guy now and who's, who's saying, man, I wish they had that when we were <laughs> when we were in the heart <laughs> of it. You know, our tools were Facebook had just started, and, and, right. we, had, uh, and we had Craigslist and, you know, and then boots <laughs> on the ground. And, and that's what you did. And so, yeah. I mean, we've kept up with the change. It's been in a different, in a different way. So that's, that's really cool to hear how it's changed. Have you worked at all with some crowdsourcing and seeing how powerful that's been for bands uh, getting funding? Yes. I, um, I also offer on my site, I have a, a rock sources page that I call it. It's basically just free resources that I've created, uh, templates and workbooks and, and so forth. And one of them is a crowdfunding workbook that I've used for a lot of my clients. And what that really is, is the, the key, in my opinion, to doing a, a successful crowdfunding is to be super clear on your mission. Like, why are you doing this? I, I think it doesn't work for bands that just get up and say, help me raise money for my album. Well, why? Like, what is it? Why is this album so meaningful to you? What is it going to provide the listeners? And also, a lot of the things that I also help artists realize, you know, one of them recently came to me with their crowdfunding and and they said, well, you know, tell me what you think. And I looked at their rewards and I thought, okay, you want them to donate $15 for, you know, a signed CD. And... Honestly, like I don't know what they would do with that. I mean, no <laughs> offense to the artist, they're a wonderful talent talentful like artist. They have right. so much to give, but to somebody that doesn't really know you, you're asking them for $15 for a signature that they don't know why that's an investment. And I think if you give rewards in a sense of what can I give them? What you know, don't just make it Make it an experience. I think that's really the point. So the reward doesn't even necessarily have to be connected to your album. But the reward could be, you know, you get to choose. um, If you did want to connect it to your album, you could say you get to choose my next single. And you get to um, be part of the board that um, has the okay on the final edits of my music video. I mean, like, get them involved in an actual experience rather than just say, well, I'll sign a copy of your CD that they're probably not even going to use because they don't have a CD player anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's all of that. Don't make it about you and what you think people should value. 
you know, because artists are going to think, well, I'm going to be famous one day and that signature is going to be worth something. <laughs> yes, that might be true, you know, and that's valuable in your mind. But for somebody that is going to take a chance on you for the first time, what could make them feel really cool working at their nine to five in an office all day? What could really get them excited? So, you know, think there. And I think that's really what I work with artists on is is coming from a place of gratitude, coming from a place of making the fan feel like they matter. Yeah, that goes a long way. That's that's good input. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, fans like to be part of, of helping the – we like the rock star. Who doesn't like to see the rock star? Right. But we also like to feel like we're part of helping them get to that journey, and that's why you see shows like American Idol and The Voice and all these are, are so wildly popular and get voted on is people feel like they're having a say in it, and they just – Right. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a fun feeling uh, for the fans to have, and that's why you sometimes – see fans turn on their audience or turn on oh, their sure. band when they when they think they made it big and they, they're quote-unquote sellouts right um, but really they help them get to that level of success so <laughs> but i agree make an emotional connection and, and i was talking on a podcast a few days ago and we talked about the why and we said before you do anything else answer why put, put yourself in their shoes and why would it matter to them and i think right. when you do that that makes a big difference and that's that's i think exactly what you're saying and make that connection of what matters to them and why they would care Right. And I think she ended up making her mission about, you know, her music, um, the the client that I was speaking of, her music was empowering. And it was all about um, accepting your the body that you have, accepting the, per, you know, what you have to offer people, you know, mm. just embracing yourself. And I was like, th- you know, that's your why. Like, this is why people want to give, because you're showing them, help me make this music and this music is going to empower you. So it's not help me make my music so I can get my album done. It's help me make my music so I can really provide you with something amazing. And that's selling, yeah. and that's selling something so much bigger, too, because we can all connect with a song and we all have our favorite songs. But whenever you can connect with an artist and something that's about their story that's different, that makes you connect to them more and want to consume and absorb more of their content because of who they are. Right. I want to get more into, into you as the entrepreneur, but first tell me a little bit more about the kind of service that you offer. You're in New York, correct? I'm in okay. Queens. Um, I work with artists from all over. I've had clients in Germany, Miami, California, um, Nashville. Um, but so s- Skype and, and social media, as you were saying, is a wonderful thing. Um, right. But mainly what I offer, you know, I, I, the, the dreaded word therapy, um, but, yeah. I, but I, don't, I don't market it like that. What I, what I really offer is getting artists confidence and clarity on their career and on their mission. Um, I also work with managers and other people, like I say, um, musicpreneurs, as I call them. Um, but my main mission is to help redefine the hustle. And what I mean by that is to get out of the mindset that they have to go without sleep or they have to do things that they don't really want to do, but it's it's what everybody else does, so that's what they have to do. I, I help them get out of that fog and yeah. say, well, what is it that you want to do? And let's get clear on that because maybe – what you want to do doesn't need you going to all these networking gigs that you hate, or maybe it, you know, maybe you're not an artist that has to be on tour if you don't like traveling. Right. Maybe there's other ways to do it. So, you know, it's um, it's figuring out what their true mission is, and then and then what are those steps? And and mainly what I like to instill in them is the importance of self care, is the importance of having a sound mind when they do all of this and and really making put putting emphasis on the fact that they matter and that they don't have to kill themselves to impress other people and get s- swallowed up in this whole myth of nobody sleeps in this industry that is a right. myth if somebody's telling you they're not sleeping they're lying to you because they would be <laughs> dead it's impossible right. to just go you know you will hit a wall if you do that um so that's really my mission and that's what I do my services um, really offer just, you know, I call it the rock star advocate because I really just offer support. I'm there to guide them. One of my most uh, popular services is email consulting, where they just email me whenever they need to, and and I, um, on like a monthly basis, um, provide just endless uh, support to them. Uh, you want to, you want feedback on a song. You want feedback on oh, I'm about to meet this person. What should I say? You want feedback on an email you're about to pitch to somebody. You know, whatever it is, let's talk it out. Um, let me give you a third part. You know, a third party feedback on it, and um, you know, just also also just checking in with them and sending them an email saying, hey, I know you've got this coming up. You're gonna rock it. You're gonna be amazing. And that's really what I'm there for is just to be that support and and be that defogger 
as I call it, um, mm. so that they can get out of their own head sometimes. So tell me about your journey. What motivated you to be in the music industry? I mean, you obviously have a passion for it, and it's, it's your calling. What, can you point to a moment in your background that made you want to be in this industry? Sure. Um, from the moment I was a little kid, I mean, I just remember wanting to be in the music industry, but not wanting to be famous and then not truly understanding what that meant. Like I remember listening to Janet Jackson and thinking, man, I would love to be her backup singer or I would love to just like be on stage with her, but I don't want to be her. I don't want that. I don't want people looking at me, but I would love to be a part of whatever (laughs) is going on. And, um, and then I remember being in junior high and seeing a behind the music of Russell Simmons and thinking, wow, okay, I want to be what I want to be him. I want to do what he does. And I still, again, didn't understand what exactly he did, which is why my first endeavor was to start a a label Hmm. because I was like, well, that's what Russell Simmons did. So that must be the only option behind the scenes is to run a label. Um, And that's that's kind of where my passion went. And I literally just happened to I had never heard of Drexel University at the time. They were they weren't they're a lot bigger these days. Um, Right. But back it was like 2002. I had never heard of them. And I just got a postcard in the mail. Um, actually, I guess it was 2000. And I got a postcard in the mail saying, do you want to be in the music industry? Do you want to learn the business behind the scenes? Do you? And I was like, yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. I'm just got-. And it was the only school I focused on. I was like, this is where I'm going to go. Um, I like to make clean, simple decisions. And right. I got the postcard. I told my parents, this is where I'm going. See you later. And um, as soon as I got involved in that, I just... I just become became so in it was like what else can I do? I took on whatever internships I could. I worked for all of my professors. I I had like three different side jobs, whatever they needed. All of our professors were in the industry and I thought how can I help because I wanted to learn every aspect hmm. before I figured out what I wanted to do. And um and then I found a mentor in uh my boss at Atlantic Records and I followed him to Astral Works and I did it until I realized I didn't want to do it anymore. And that's kind of always been my my thing. I've just then I was like, well, I'm interested in law. So then I did that until I just was done. Like I knew, OK, I, I've, I've taken this as far as I could take it. I don't want to go to law school, but this has been really interesting. Thanks for the info. I want to learn psychology now. OK, thank you. I took this as far, you know, got my degree. And now I kind of figured all right, now I kind of know what I like and I don't like about the business and where can I have my impact? And so I just realized, well, I've got the psychology and I'm really passionate about that. And I've burnt out more than once and I've definitely learned what not to do in the industry. And so how can I help artists in that way? And that's, it just kind of organically came about. I like that story. It seems like you you had a loose framework for what you wanted to do because when you saw that card, it, it, it pinpointed it for you. And right. You were willing to learn from others and take jobs to learn your craft. You weren't too proud to do that, and you learned as you could. And then you got a mentor, and then you continued to get the skills that you needed with education, and, and you took all that and learned from your past. I, I love that story. I think that's really powerful. And, Thank you. Uh, and we've got interns that uh, college credits for coming to work at our agency, and, and uh, I see a lot of pressure on them sometimes at 19, 20, 21, 22 to know everything that they're supposed to do. And I, I tell yes. them, I say, at 29 years old, I was in the music industry in Hollywood, and, and yeah. I'm 40 now, and I say, and then I've owned an agency for almost a decade, and, and I didn't know at 22 that I was going to do those things. I just right. knew that I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and, and, and I knew that I needed to continue to learn from others and to take jobs and not to be too proud to learn. Right. <laughs> and, and I think that's really powerful. And so I, I love that story. And I think for me, those are some of the, the steps that I like to share. I mean, you, you almost lined it out exactly the success story. You didn't have a direct map, but right. I feel like I hear that often with these interviews is, is those that really get onto something really big and unique and do well with it, have followed these steps and it's a continual journey. It's not at 22, you had it all figured out, but as you, as you grow, you start to put all the pieces together. Thank you. Absolutely. And I actually got a, a chance when I was 22 to meet Russell Simmons. And I, I asked him, yeah, it was amazing. And I, and I asked him, I said, you know, how do you know when to listen to the quote unquote experts and mentors? And how do you know when to listen to yourself? Cause I was really struggling thinking I just quit my job 
to do my own business. What was I thinking? Right. You know, I had people say to me, you'll never step foot in this industry again. Like, what do you, <laughs> you know, are you insane? And um, he just said to me, listen, do what you think is right. And if it's wrong, then tomorrow you wake up and you try something else. And if that's wrong, you wake up tomorrow and you try something else. And it really just kind of gave me the permission. And my, you know, my parents were always the same way too, thankfully, of saying, listen, do it until you hate it. And then if you do it and you re- like always figure out what you don't want to do, huh. you, you might not always know what you want to do. And sometimes you have to figure out what you don't like before you get there right. and, <laughs> and always trusting, listen, my legal, my time as a paralegal has never gone to waste. My time going to back to school for psychology has never been a waste. Um, you will take it and use it in some way. Right. Just don't worry about that just yet. <laughs> right. Don't burn bridges and continue to garner. Yes. And sometimes I've had enough of these things now where sometimes you go, I'm not sure where this fits in, but I'm, I'm going to compartmentalize this and, and trust that I'll either recall it someday as a decision I shouldn't do again, <laughs> or I'll build onto something else. That leads me to my next question. I mean, when I'm a guest on podcasts, they always like to ask me about failure, which ouch, right? And so, <laughs> and so recently I've had a venture that I, I let go and, and moved on from a side project and it hurts, it stings. And, mm. and you deal with that disappointment sometimes because they're your babies, you build them and, and your heart's in it. Tell me about dealing with failure in the past and, and what did you go through and how did you, how did you pull yourself back up to where you could motivate and continue? Sure thing. No, I, I love that question. And I think, um, failure is such a necessary part and not enough people are honest about it. Um, mm. Uh, to other people. So I'm so glad you asked that. Um, One of the things that I had looked at as a failure is when it was, I think, 2012, um, I I loved having a business partner. And I love that my business partner was somebody I considered a sister to me, and I still do. And she's a wonderful person, so intelligent and so talented. And I could feel something was off, and I could feel that she was terrified to tell me what she needed to tell me. And so I just said, okay, like, what's up? And she said, this isn't what I want to do anymore. And I want to go do something else. And, you know, I know this business means so much to you. And, you know, she went on and on. And I, I said, listen, like, thank you for telling me. I could tell something was up. And, um, you know, I said, if you're cool with it, I'm going to keep the name and keep going. And she, you know, wished me well, it was fine. And then as soon as she left, it was like, I didn't want to keep going and I didn't know what direction I wanted to take it in anymore. And, um, I had a lot going on with my family at the time and I had just was about to graduate with my master's and I had that going on and I kind of panicked and I, I really had a hard time with it, not because she left, but because I felt like I failed as a partner. I felt like, why doesn't she want to work with me anymore? Or what did I how did I make this business something that she no longer wanted to do? And it took me a little while to really realize, you know, that's her, that's her path. And she's entitled to that. And maybe this business really wasn't what I wanted either. And we were both kind of just two people doing things that we felt we should be doing. And I got a business coach after that. And she taught me get rid of should. (laughs) That is a horrible, nasty word and get rid of that. And so I took time off, which was a scary thing to do. And I got a regular old job and I figured out what I really wanted to do. And that's when the Rockstar Advocate was born, where it was really like, I'm not beholden to anybody anymore. I don't need to please a business partner and I don't need to make sure we're on the same page. And as scary as that was, it was very liberating. And that's really what came out of it was, okay, stop stop looking to somebody else to answer my questions. What What is it that I want to do? And I never really thought about it, like really thought about it before. Hmm. And and now I look back and I say like, wow, you know, she's remained supportive. I've remained supportive of her. And, and I finally found something that I really, truly love to do. Yeah, that's great. So in that process, how, give me a timeline. How, how long has it taken you to find yourself or to, to find your way in some of these different pockets of growth? Mm-hmm. What does that look like in, the, in those valleys? And I don't want to harp on the valleys, but I just, you know, for those that are listening and, okay. and identifying, because again, it's, it's tough to see them uh, sometimes to let them go. Oh, 100%. Um, yeah. So the Valley, I mean, it lasted about a year and a half, almost two years. And, you know, we had spent eight years building our business together and it really never became anything, you know, big. And it was because we were just kind of spinning our wheels and not really sure of our why or what we wanted to 
for it to become. And so when she left and I was kind of fiddling around, I just thought, oh, my goodness, did I waste these eight years? Did I right. throw every – should I have stayed at Astroworks? Um, do I go back and work for somebody else? Uh, it was – Real, and I did have a therapist, and I um, I did go, and, and I did kind of have a, a bit of a depression, and right. and I, I thought, you know, what do I do? And, and if I'm using this time to step away, can I come back? You know, will, will I have wasted this now year and a half when I wanted to come back with the rock star advocate? I thought, did I stay away too long? Hmm. Um, and I got really nervous about coming back out with this, and... Um, and and trying to figure all that out and okay well if this thing I, I had spent eight years on didn't work out how long do I spend on the rock star advocate before I realize it's you know all of these things you grapple with um, the one thing I learned from getting a business coach was that you're always going to grapple with something and and you're always going to doubt yourself and have fears and if you can just get it out there and test it first you know um, I think one of the mistakes I made with my past business was that. We were such perfectionists, and so we very rarely got something out to the public because we were, st- oh, this this isn't right, this isn't right, got to right. tweak this, got to tweak that. And my coach always said, you know, done is better than perfect. Right, and yes. So, yeah, and it's something that I was like, what? But it's not ready. Like, what are you talking about? And and I've done more, so much more with the Rockstar Advocate in the last two years than I did in eight years with the other business, and it's because... I'm just getting things out there and I'm accepting criticism and I'm accepting having to redo something or tweak it or refine it because that's the whole point. If you wait till it's perfect and it's perfect in your mind and then you put it out and somebody says, well, that's not really what I need or that's actually not what I was looking for, then what the heck? (laughs) So if you just put it out and you kind of create it as you go along and then you're getting feedback from your clients saying, well, I could use more of this or I could use more of this, then you're in a more flexible position rather than, well, I just put this whole thing together. What do you mean you don't like it this way? (laughs) Yeah. I've seen there's countless brands or potential brands that I've looked at that just could not pull the trigger. Mm. I, I understand getting a product right. And if you have competition and, and certain types of products and certain, you have to sure. with patents and all of those things, I get that. But I've also seen enough where I said, well, you've, like you said, you know, good. I think what was it? What was your quote? Good is better than, or done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> done is better than perfect. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you do have to let the market, you, sometimes you have to perfect it in the marketplace, but you've got to get it out there. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder if it's fear sometimes I understand perfectionism, but, but sometimes I feel like it's a fear of, of rejection. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And so I think that's another thing where failure comes in. And I've had, a, I've had businesses that I've done well with and I've sold and I've had some that just didn't, that were before their time that's being kind or, or that just weren't quite a right fit in the right place. And so, mm-hmm. but you know what, because of those things and being willing to pull the trigger, now I have to make good decisions when I launch something. But I think those experiences help me learn, uh, help me get over my fear and, and it helps me to help clients launch businesses as well as, as I've done it enough times. And and so right. you start to kind of get a, a barometer of where you should be uh, if you're launching enough of them. And, and so if you're launching multiple products to, to your clients and, and offering new services, you start to in the marketplace and live, you start to figure out kind of generally where it should be. And then you can make little tweaks. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things, you know, again, in having a coach and having somebody that's there to guide you, which is what I hope to offer musicians, I have my own. And one of the also the lessons that I've learned is that, you know, when you when you get it out there and you have to make the tweaks, you know, that's OK. When when you are afraid to put something out there, when like you said, it is very much fear based, you have to stop yourself and ask, well, what exactly am I afraid of? Because sometimes it's pretty vague. And when things are vague, then we can't really get a handle on them. So if you're able to really think about, well, what am I so afraid of? The future is 50 50. We immediately assume, well, the future is going to be bad. It's going to be horrible. And they're going to hate this. And it's going to be bad. But we don't know that. And it could equally be just as positive. So why not? Like I, I sell eBooks on my, on my website and you know, one of them, in, um, actually almost all of them include this exercise called flip the script. Hmm. So it's like write out your fears, but then flip them. So what's, what's going to be the positive version of that? Like, you know, publishing a book. Oh my goodness. What if nobody buys it? Right. Yeah. What if a bunch of people buy it and it creates a movement and everyone is super excited about what I've put out there? Yeah. 
Like, why not? That's great. And and then on the flip side is some of us entrepreneur wired, uh, we always think too positive <laughs> and, we're, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're quick to draw on. So that's the other side of it. So there's a balance, I think, right, right. But, but, but I think failure sometimes helps us learn to be cautious for those that are on the other side of things. But I think everybody has something great within them and they're destined. Everybody has a potential to be destined to do great, great things. Mm-hmm. And in mm-hmm. and, and, and whatever your industry, I mean, I just interviewed a guy uh, from Ole Miss who, who's, who came over as head of landscaping and created a movement called Landscaping University and out of people picking up trash had a movement form where people's lives were transformed. And, I, and, and again, that so sounds awesome. sappy, but I, I think all of us have something amazing. So the listeners out there who feel like they're not in a, in a place of complete satisfaction or feel like you have more to give or sitting an, on an idea, I really want to encourage you to explore that farther and and, and take the next step with it. And, and so, you know, I, I know that you're in a, in a different biz, business than a lot of us, but than a lot of our listeners, but I still think it's applicable. Tell me about your eBooks. Are those yours? That's your copy, your content? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I've um, what I did was I created the Rockstar Summit, uh, which launched um, about a couple weeks ago, first week in April, and um, it was a three-day virtual music conference. And it was an idea that I had after speaking at, at some amazing conferences in person. But I myself am an introvert. Um, you know, I could get up and speak in front of hundreds of people, but put me in a room where everyone's just kind of coming up to me, and I. I just want to crawl in a hole. Yeah, sure. So, um, and I know for a lot of my clients, that's how it is. They drag themselves to these conferences and they, they never know what to say or they get intimidated by the room or there's alcohol involved and then that makes it, you know, what's my limit, so All to right. speak. And, you know, it, there's so much to grapple with in those situations. So I thought, well, why don't I get some of my best friends who are experts in different fields of the industry to do video, I, I did video interviews with them, and then I hosted them live on my website. Yeah. Artists bought tickets. They could ask questions. There was a live Q&A. There was a Facebook group that was open to, so we could check in and support one another as they watched the videos on their own time. Didn't yeah. have to take off from their two or three day jobs that they might have to work. And um, and I and so in doing so, I created these six ebooks to go along with all of the. Um, the different uh, panels that I had. And so I created one finance, uh, one in uh, social media branding, one was for legal uh, contracts and getting all of that stuff in order, one was for self-care and mindset, and then the others were for recording and for touring. Um, So uh, they're not all up on the site just yet, but they are available. Um, I'm getting them up this week on my site. But they're available for sale. All all people that came to the summit got them for free, but they're basically just um, affordable ebooks. They're about ten to twelve pages each that have information that you can use. But on the flip side, it also comes with exercises so that you can figure out. Well, now that I've learned the information, how do I actually apply it to me? Right. Because a lot of the times you get the information and then you get overwhelmed and then you get paralyzed and then you don't do anything. Um, because you're so immersed in everything that you just learned. So I broke it down into six different sections so that they could learn, you know, maybe they know enough about the legal stuff, but they don't really know how to manage their finances. Or maybe they're great on social media, but they want to go on tour and they're not sure how to manage their own tour. Hmm. So it kind of broke it down separately so you can kind of pick a la carte. And, And there are exercises in there, like I said, to really practice and make sure you this is how you're also going to retain the information by just like we would do in school you know there you went home and you had homework um so that's that's what that is all about and those are the books that i um that i've uh done recently and then i also offer like i said free templates as well and free ebooks that are up on the site um that that just offer you know basic understanding of of the industry so that you can get started on your own in case you don't have a budget to work with. I want to talk about the platform that you use for me because it really stands out to me. It, I talk sometimes to, to groups about meeting your customers where they are, anticipating mm. their needs, understanding their emotional connections, understanding what's important to them, and rather than making them come to you, meet them where they are. And so to, for you to understand that they that maybe they're introverts and their preferred learning style might be a little bit different and be a little bit more incognito, but yet they're very curious. And, and these, these artists and are, are, are brilliant people that, that – 
want to learn, but they just don't like the, the, the platforms that have been provided them. So for you to set up these Facebook groups and the videos and all of that, I really like that. Um, and I talk sometimes to people about build, build tools that fit what you need and don't make everybody come and fit into your tools instead because yes. they're not going to. And so, right. and then you're, and then you're going to say, why didn't this work? And so on a whole separate conversation is what you're doing is great because you're actually making your, your understanding your customers, anticipating their needs, and then building tools that are appropriate for the campaign uh, so that they're most likely to engage. And I think that's really important for, for myself and for our listeners to remember whenever we're testing different campaigns to see what does and doesn't work. Thank you. And yeah, and, and to be honest, again, it's like, you know, this is my almost 15th year in the industry. And, you know, like you said, I'm doing that now and it's great and it's working for me and the feedback was amazing and I'll be running the Rockstar Summit again this summer. Um, but it didn't always happen that way. And I was for the longest time creating products that I was like, well, this is how you should do it. And this is where you should be. And again, using that word should, and, mm. and then artists were, you know, I, when I first started out with this company, I was, let's do therapy sessions and let's really get down to why you're depressed or why. And I was trying to shove therapy sessions down their throats <laughs> and it was like, yeah, I can help that way. And yes, you can see results, but maybe that's not how you want to be approached. Right. And most artists don't, um, you know, and, and therapy is still taboo. So right. then it was like, okay, again, I had to go through those failures and go through that feedback from clients being like, yeah, that's great, but I wouldn't buy it that way. And, and, and getting off my own high horse to go a- and ask former clients, hey, if I, if I approached you with the service, would you use it? And if not, why? And a lot of them would say, because you called it therapy, and that's weird, and I don't want to do it. And <laughs> and it was like, okay, so what if I said we're going to revamp your social media, and in, in within it, we're going to work on your mindset and how to connect with, oh, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, cool, sign me up. So, you know, learning, like you said, where they are and how they want to be approached is something that I had to learn. So, like you said, those failures are needed along the way. I didn't just get here. <laughs> I think something else interesting is that you ask them and oftentimes I'll hear, I'm not sure what the customer wants or not responding. And, and the simple, simple, often overlooked answer is ask them, right. <laughs> show them and ask them. And they won't always yeah. tell you directly, but sometimes they do. Wow. Imagine mm-hmm. that and, and get feedback from them and then adjust it and then make something they want. I mean, we get protective of our products and our babies, and we we sometimes need to be a little bit vulnerable within reason. I mean, we need passion, and we need to believe in what, what we're doing, but we need feedback from the, from the market and from our, our target base. I think it's very important. It's crucial, and we need to be able to take that, uh, have a little bit of humility whenever we, we put it out there and just be willing to make some adjustments. And I'll tell you that music is very much like that. And my background in music, when you put art out there and it gets ripped apart, that's tough. So. Wow, absolutely. And that's what I tell my clients all the time one of them had recently asked me well what merch should I create I'm about to go on tour and you know do I do t-shirts do I do keychains like what and I said go on Facebook right now you you have a direct connection to your fans right now like go ask them and they almost feel like you know everything has to be unveiled everything has to be a surprise it really doesn't (laughs) like you can let them in on the process it's okay (laughs) can you give me any examples of of artists or of projects that you've seen where they've done a good job of asking and gotten feedback from their fan base and and uh, gotten a great response that way some great artists on Instagram that I have been following that are really great in asking, um, I'm blanking on their names. I'm just looking it up. Uh, uh, Gina Cotillo. Okay. Uh, she's a great artist. She's, she's now a friend of mine and we've done a couple of conferences together. Gina Cotillo, I had found on Instagram and she was another one just asking for feedback. Hey guys, I'm about to put out my album. Which artwork do you like the best? Hmm. You know, um, Hey, I'm, I'm going to set up my next music video. Which single should, should be next. Um, and she's always, you know, she, she does a lot of videos. She does a lot of, um, again, questions and makes it like a fun game, uh, for her artists. Um, another one is, uh, a client of mine, um, Monty Mater. Uh, you can find her on Monty Mater, uh, Monty Mater Music. Um, she was another one who was asking me about the crowdfunding and actually her crowdfunding is going phenomenally right now. Um, she's another one that really, empowers her fans and then you know checks in on them how are you feeling today you know what 
what what music could get you going right now? And and she uses that and she thinks about that. And yes, you don't want fans to dictate the music that you create or if you're a business person, dictate the products that you make. But you want to at least make sure you're on the same page. Right. They're the ones who are going to consume it. Yeah, you get, mm-hmm. you don't want to sell out, but you also want to make sure that you right. can make adjustments right. uh, that make it as enjoyable for them, as enjoyable experience as it can be. Right. So, so what's next for you? Well, I'm really excited about the Rockstar Summit. Uh, it, it, Like I said, it went really well. The experts that were involved loved being able to do it in their pajamas um, <laughs> and not having to fly out and do a conference. Um, so that format worked really well, and I'm very excited to run it again this summer. Um, I'm also working on um, a planner that I hope to have out by uh, end of June, early July, hopefully, um, a Another college friend of mine, uh, she's a design engineer, uh, Alyssa Jackson, and she and I are putting together a life planner specifically for musicians. Um, I'm very OCD with my organizational skills and keeping everything uh, together and categorized. A lot of my rock sources that I have up there are spreadsheets. I'm a big fan of spreadsheets. And so she and I created this planner um, where... Yeah, okay, you have other planners out there that kind of walk you through, you know, keeping your calendar and your appointments and everything like that. But when it comes to being a musician, there there are just a lot of other things that you have to uh, keep in mind when doing that work-life balance, which is something that I know you speak a lot about of um, in your podcasts and and whatnot. And it's it's kind of how do you juggle all these different hats of maybe being your own PR person, being your own manager at times, uh, being your own booking agent. Uh, how do you manage all of that? So we've created some really fun exercises and templates in this book where it's like part calendar, but part uh, organizational uh, tool. And it's a physical book because I truly believe we need, we still need that pen to paper feeling. Um, and so that's going to be my next really big uh, thing, which is uh, getting into creating actual products that, that artists can use to help them. And and then keeping along the same path of, you know, I love doing podcasts like this, uh, speaking at music conferences is a still a big uh, favorite of mine. So continuing to do that in the coming months is really what I've got coming up. So my question is, how do you stay focused and know when what you're doing is going to give addition to the value for your life and satisfaction, but also help you to continue to build this this amazing business that you're growing. Yes, um, I keep a notebook with me. It's it's my uh, just my safety. It's my my security blanket. Um, every day when I wake up and every night before I go to bed, I write down what my goals are for the day. I try to keep it to three main goals, and and then I look at those goals and like up on my wall by my desk, I have my why. Like my mission of like why I created the Rockstar Advocate, what I want to do. And so when I, I literally, I just force myself to sit there and I say, okay, what I want to accomplish tomorrow is that still in line with my why. And I'm just constantly checking back in with myself. And that's part of the self-care and the mindset work is to just constantly checking back in, reflecting, tweaking because you might have a great idea or you met somebody today and they have a great idea and it doesn't mean it's not great, but if it's going to distract you or take you away from your main purpose, maybe it's not right for right now. And I used to get very distracted by shiny things. And then (laughs) a month or two would go by and be like, Oh, wait a minute. I was really wanting to get this done and it's not done yet. So, you know, again, coming back to that main purpose and saying it makes decision making very easy for me because so many great things come up, but I say, well, if this is tied to my why, then it's a surefire yes. If it's not, then I really have to debate, do I have time for it, or is it worth you know, getting distracted from my main mission? So that's really how I stay on course. It's just every morning and every night, it's the first and last thing I do is to check back in with where I am in my in my journey. I, I like the daily reminder. When we build marketing plans, we, we have three rules that we have. One, number one, how does this decision reflect or align with the brand's core values? Number two, what's going to be the relevancy of this decision we're about to make to each of our target segments? Is it going to, how's it going to affect them positively or negatively? Is it going to bring value to them? And number three, how is the decision going to add value to our existing campaign that's going to meet mm-hmm. our objectives? And if it doesn't fit with the three of these things, then then we need to recognize it as a distraction or as a shiny object. 
doesn't mean we can't do it, but just right. please recognize that it is a, it is a change. Yes. <laughs> and I, I love, love your that. daily, I like your daily reminder. That's so great because again, especially in the creative business, which we're both in, especially when there's all these new shiny objects and tools and, and especially with the types of clients or clientele you work with, it's very easy to, to get excited and, and build on and get distractions that, that again, sometimes they're good and it's good to have distractions, but, but that can derail your whole, uh, the, the overall arching objective that you want to reach. Right. Exactly. So is there anything else you want to share with us today as a young entrepreneur that has worked your way to where you are today? What, what advice would you give someone out there that is either struggling with, with their product or their service, or that is kind of at a crossroads of, of going a direction where they want to launch a business? Yes. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much. Cause I love what you, you do. And I love listening to your podcast. You have thank such you. An, a great message. So I would say, listen to more of the, these podcasts well, listen to more of, of, yes, of business leadership series. Um, what I would also say is go make mistakes, like go get your hands dirty. I mean, I was, you know, top honors student, always straight A's in school and, you take that mindset and you think, well, that that's how it's going to work in the real world. And, um, you know, I think we need to teach the youth that it more like get dirty, make more mistakes, uh, go back to the drawing board. Um, you know, it's that fear of, I worked so hard to get into the music industry. And at 22, I left what I thought I had worked my whole high school career towards. Hmm. And that was so frightening. And I had to really learn, I can come back. You can come back. You can retweak it. You can invent your own job. You can, whether you're going to be an entrepreneur or work for somebody else, you can always change your mind and it's okay. And it's okay to be wrong. Um, that really, as soon as you accept that, you really start to make more progress. Um, and, and to, and to really, when you're struggling and hitting a wall, go take a nap, go out for a walk, go call a relative that you like that you haven't called in a while. Like, go step away. And my mom used to always tell me that, and it took a while before I trusted it, um, that it's okay to step back. And then you come back with a clear mindset and you're just like, whoa, how did I not see what I needed to fit? You know, (laughs) it's amazing how a a walk around the block could completely, you know, uh, change your perspective when you come back. And, and so don't be afraid. Well, you know, somebody only got two hours of sleep. And if, if I stop to watch a TV show right now, it means I don't want it as badly. No, like that's not how it works. Stay in your lane. (laughs) That's great. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I really appreciate being our guest. I I wanted to have you on for a while here. Love what you're doing. Um, I love the, uh, your tagline, you're the rock star advocate and you have be the rock for your future star. And I think that's yes. really powerful. That, and me knowing as many musicians as I've had that, that are chasing the dream, I, that just is so appropriate for giving them the beacon and the, and the right guidance that they need. So that's really powerful. The rockstaradvocate.com. You can learn more about Suzanne and what she's doing. Suzanne, thanks again for being our guest. And I look forward to seeing all the great things that you do in the coming years. Thank you so much. It's been a real honor. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Take a five-minute complimentary marketing assessment for your business. Whether you're a startup or an established brand looking for more quality customers for your business, this confidential assessment will help you identify the next logical steps for appropriate marketing tools, strategy, and development for making sure your branding and marketing campaign is a success. Visit AssessMyMarketing.com today. That's AssessMyMarketing.com.